Hello and welcome to the course introduction to the psychology of language. I am Ark Verma and we are running in the 8th week of the course. This incidentally is also the last lecture of the course. I will be wrapping up the unit on bilingualism on this lecture which is the third lecture. Uh, we have across the 8 weeks talked about various components in language. Uh, in this week we are talking about various aspects of bilingualism. Uh, I am not really going into a lot of detail uh, of that because that will be partly a repetition of whatever we have already done. Uh, obviously having much more details but I have decided to keep it uh, slightly uh, shallow if you may uh, you know so call it. Uh, in the in the uh, earlier two weeks of this uh, you know uh, earlier two lectures of this week we have talked about uh, the conceptual representations part of how the conceptual representations uh, will be for bilinguals. We talked about the word association model, the conceptual mediation model and the revised hierarchical model. In the last lecture I talked to you about uh, the co-activation or the simultaneous activation of the two languages of the bilingual uh, regardless of the fact that the bilingual is engaged in listening to speech or producing speech. In today's lecture I will talk to you a little bit about uh, models of control or aspects of how do uh, you know bilinguals or how bilinguals might be managing the two languages. Now, as we saw a uh, lot of research suggests that uh, usually both languages of the bilingual are active simultaneously uh, regardless of the modality. Uh, it is also however observed that bilingual speakers do not really commit a lot of errors, they do not really commit a lot of uh, uh, speech errors, they do not really commit a distinct uh, lot of comprehension errors uh, which kind of in either of the two languages suppose say for example as a bilingual speaker I am speaking in English, it is not uh, uh, happening that you are seeing that constantly I am breaking into Hindi or suppose if I were to uh, start talking to you in Hindi you will not really observe that I will constantly in the middle break into English. Uh, so, the amount of errors is also uh, fairly low and not distinctively higher for a bilingual than a monolingual. Now, having said that it could imply or it probably implies already that the bilingual speakers do enjoy the advantage of having a particular mechanism that helps them to keep the two languages from interfering with each other. Okay. So, that is something very uh, interesting and this is therefore invited a lot of curiosity and a lot of research into the fact that how are bilinguals keeping their two languages separate be it production or be it comprehension. Today we will be talking about some of that kind of research. Now early theories basically proposed that bilinguals could be avoiding these mistakes in comprehension or by production or production by simply switching off the other language. So, this is basically referred to as the language switch hypothesis which says that when I have to talk in English I will switch off my Hindi or when I have to talk in Hindi I will switch off my English and in that way there are no active representations of Hindi uh, running around my head if I am talking in English or no active representations of Hindi running around in my head where I am talking in English. This could very easily explain that there will be no speech errors and no interference and so on and this will be very interesting. But uh, we have seen across uh, you know the last lecture so many studies uh, we have seen so much research that uh, say for example there is a uh, lot of evidence about this simultaneous activation of the two languages. Also say for example uh, you could uh, expect that a similar pattern of low interference or non-interference would happen from L1 to L2 as well as L2 to L1. But uh, it has been observed across a bunch of studies that there is even if there is less interference there is a lot of in degree there will be a lot of interference from L1 to L2 rather than from L2 to L1. Now one interesting set of studies uh, or one very uh, seminal experiment uh, kind of uh, you know brought this factor to light and uh, you know made this uh, a really very interesting topic for around uh, almost a decade or more than a decade in bilingualism research and this experiment was done by Muter and Alport in 1989. Now Muter, Muter and Alport basically asked their participants to name Arabic numerals uh, in Arabic and English. And what they find is that uh, and they basically created what is called a language switching experiments. So, the typical design of a language switching experiment is that the numbers will come you have to name each of them in English or Arabic. In what language you have to name basically can be said uh, can be signaled to you by a cue. So, what can happen is there is a screen there is a you know a, a red color 
uh, you know background and there is a number you know that you have to name it in English. There is another screen there is a green color background you know you have to name it in Hindi and there could be say for example English, 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 Hindi, 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 Hindi and then English. So there will be passages where you are not switching and there are passages where switching from English to Hindi and passages where switching from Hindi to English. This is typically the design of a language switching experiment. Now participants here are uh, have four kinds of trials, English non-switch trials, Hindi non-switch trials, English to Hindi switch trials, Hindi to English switch trials. Depending on what is your L1 and L2, you can have L1 to L2 switch trials, L2 to L1 switch trials. What Newton and Alport found in their study was that participants experienced asymmetrical switching cost from L2 to L1 uh, as opposed to switching from L1 to L2. So, what was happening is they were finding it harder to switch from the L2 to switch from speaking in English to Hindi. And in some sense, this is slightly counterintuitive. Why should be speaking in uh, the native language be difficult? So, Muter and Alport also call it as a paradoxical switch cost kind of scenario. Uh, for uh, basic purposes, we'll just call it asymmetric language switching costs. Okay. So, the idea is that the switching cost from L1 to L2 are not equal to the switching cost from L2 to L1 with the qualification that L2 to L1 switch costs are generally higher than L1 to L2 switch costs. Now, they proposed that this is happening because of uh, what they refer to as the involuntary persistence of a task set. Involuntary persistence basically means that because you are naming English, you kind of there is sort of inertia or persistence of the English naming task set as opposed to and that is kind of what is creating difficulty to shift into the Hindi naming task. So, basically it is kind of a inertia uh, sort of a situation. Now, the idea is uh, if you kind of probe in a little bit deeper and try and understand this, the idea is that for most bilinguals, the L1 representations will be stronger and the L2 representations will be weaker. Now, for once, if you are kind of uh, moving from switch naming in L1 to naming to L2, what you will have to do is you will have to suppress the L1 and start naming in L2. Because L1 is stronger, it will have, it will require much more stronger suppression and then you start naming in L2. Then when you have to start uh, from uh, L2 to L1, uh, you will also have to suppress L2 and then move to L1. Suppressing L2 will uh, take less say for example, cognitive resources as compared to what you spend in suppressing L1. Why? Because L2 is weaker and L1 is stronger. Now, when you have to name in L2 or L1 at a later point, you have to also uh, overcome the equivalent amount of suppression that you had initially applied. If you have to name in L2, you have to uh, overcome a large amount of suppression that you had initially applied on L1. And when you have to name in L1, you have to kind of uh, you know overcome a little bit amount of suppression, uh, sorry L2, you have to overcome just a little bit amount of suppression that you had applied to L2. Because in the first place, you applied a lot of suppression to L1, activating L1 back when you are switching from L2 to L1 will be difficult. Because you initially applied less amount of suppression to L2, activating uh, L2 from uh, you know when you are coming from L1 to L2 will be easier. This was supposed to be the cause why people are expecting uh, or experiencing asymmetrical switch costs. This is basically what is called the asymmetric need for suppression and that is what is leading to this kind of problem. Now, based on this and this is sort of very interesting, uh, very nice explanation for uh, participants, uh, you know, naming in the language switching kind of scenarios. And it also led to, you know, formulation of uh, particular theories that talked about this, the importance of response suppression or inhibition, uh, especially in bilinguals. And it was kind of, uh, you know, uh, reason that bilinguals might have a lot of practice with this. Okay. Now, based on the idea of asymmetric switch cost, also some theory said that okay, now we can use this to explain why people do not experience a lot of interference. And what they said was that because L2 labels are too weak uh, to interfere with L1 production, L1 uh, you know performance or L1 naming will anyways not experience a lot of interference. 
as L1 representations are heavily suppressed, they will anyways not be able to interfere with L2 performance or L2 naming. So that is some of uh, some of the reasons that people gave that why people are not experiencing a lot of intrusions uh, as far as uh, naming and performance in a particular language is concerned. Let us move on to a different kind of a, a question here. Now we have talked about the trace model of uh, you know word recognition. Uh, we know that the trace model was heavily borrowed or heavily influenced by the interactive activation model that was uh, initially developed by McLellan and Rummelhart in 1970s, uh, in 1981 that is. Now, uh, we can talk about uh, uh, one of the models that is relevant to bilingual word recognition or bilingual uh, you know, reading and this is a very seminal model which is called the bilingual interactive activation model. And the, this bilingual interactive activation or the BIA model was developed by Destra, uh, Granger and Walter van Heuvel uh, back in 1998, so almost now more than 20 years. Uh, this is basically supposed to be a connectionist computational sort of a model of visual word recognition in bilinguals. Let us uh, look at this uh, very quickly. Uh, this is basically what the model looks like and if you can see that uh, the model is very much like trace uh, in its conception. There is this feature level and there is also position level nodes and then there is a letter level. Uh, so from feature level to letter level and then there is the word level and in the word level you can see that there are both Dutch and English words activated in sort of the same way. Okay. You will see that the words are inhibiting each other, so there is some that aspect of lateral inhibition also there. And then there is this language node level, so the decision of which language the performance has to be in. And you will see Dutch words are exciting the Dutch language node, English words are exciting the English language nodes, but what is happening is the Dutch words are inhibiting uh, English uh, words and the English language nodes are inhibiting Dutch words. So that cross inhibition is also happening. Okay. And you can uh, sort of see that the interaction between the word level and uh, feature level is sort of uh, excitatory from both sides. Uh, however, there is some sort of inhibition traveling from the letter level to the word level. So, basically uh, when the particular letters will be uh, recognized, they will obviously inhibit uh, words they are not a part of which is very much like trace. This is the bilingual interactive activation model. Let us kind of look into the details a little bit uh, just to uh, explain this. Now, this model can simulate the above homograph effects we have been talking about you know chef or uh, room or coin those kind of effects in certain conditions despite the fact that in its original form it does not really represent word meaning. It can just kind of handle those effects from the virtue of letter and uh, word level activations uh, which probably uh, hints at the fact that the homograph effect cannot be attributed exclusively to the processing of meaning but also to the processing of form or spelling for that matter. Now, this model is also found to stimulate uh, the monolingual behavioral data that McLellan and Rummelhart had uh, for their interactive activation model. As you saw, I already told you that it has four levels of representations or nodes starting from feature level to letter level to word level and the language membership level. The bilinguals two languages share the feature and letter level nodes. Say for example, if uh, Dutch English is there, the features will be very similar because the orthography is exactly uh, very identical and the letters will also be shared. So, you will have no differentiation with respect to language membership at the feature and the letter level. So, there is no language tagging here. However, from the letter level upwards, you know which are English words and which are Dutch words. Similarly, you know which language uh, schema has to be activated, whether it is Dutch or it is English. Okay. Uh, so, the and uh, the idea is that this is this is an interactive model much like trace was. So, in the sense that representations at one particular level can activate and inhibit representations on the other levels, higher or lower levels. Activation can kind of uh, you know comes about in via excitatory connections, inhibition comes via uh, uh, inhibitory connections. The model uh, assumes inhibitory connections between all orthographical word form nodes due to which activating mutually in activating words will mutually inhibit each other. Again there is this whole concept of literal inhibition that we saw in uh, trace model as well. You see that words are kind of inhibiting each other anyways. Now, uh, we can take uh, how uh, you know the BIA model, uh, model uh, really works from an example. Suppose we have the Dutch English word called sand. Now, the Dutch equivalent of the word is also very similar zand, Z A N D, and sand is this. The meaning is very similar. The only thing that is uncommon is the word Z. 
okay and say for example you can have dutch words like matching dutch words like sand and mand mand is a basket sand is uh, again it means the same thing now the idea is that you can have these words that share the features and the letters so what will happen is uh, if you present the model with the word sand it will activate not only the uh, you know uh, neighbors in english but it will also activate neighbors in dutch or vice versa because the orthography is very similar uh, the number of uh, letters that are shared is uh, very similar okay so basically what will happen is activated word nodes will transmit activation to the language node of the corresponding language eventually at which moment the latter will start inhibiting the nodes of the other language because eventually you have to identify this particular word as the member of a particular language so if you you presented sand you want to recognize as a word of english even though corresponding uh, neighbors like sand and mand etc are also activated from the other language all activated word nodes would compete against each other in the recognition processes inhibiting each other through lateral inhibition until the activation in one of the nodes reach, reaches a particular threshold or say sort of a, a recognition point so once there is enough input that you know this is an english language word everything uh, dutch will sort of uh, you know um, lose out in competition and you will recognize this particular word sand as an english language word that is typically how processing in this model will happen now this particular model uh, kind of also tells us that there could be a number of other factors that will uh, influence uh, word recognition uh, you know for bilinguals say for example the number of words that are activated that compete with each other uh, if the neighborhood size is uh, smaller versus larger uh, also cross linguistic neighborhood will also come into play and you will want to say for example have a hang of how many neighbors are there in the other language as well because they are also going to be competing for the lexical activation and selection process also say for example the resting frequency or say for example the levels of activation at each word node suppose say for example uh, there is a word sand but it is very very high frequency in english but very very low frequency in hindi uh, in uh, you know uh, dutch uh, then uh, you can expect a different kind of an inter in, uh, interference profile because probably because it's not very highly active it will not really you know uh, participate in the uh, process uh, so much now how does this model account for the homograph effect according to distra and van huben uh, they basically assume that there are two orthographic word node representations for interlexical homographs one for each language basically what will happen is uh, homographs will be special kind of words which even at the word level will have connections to both so you saw at uh, the feature level shared connections letter level shared connections word level you know these are english words these are dutch words interlingual homographs will be uh, a peculiar class of words that will have connections to both the languages because uh, right from the start they are still kind of uh, holding membership in both the languages if therefore such a homograph is presented to the system uh, because of the perfect match of both its word nodes and visual input both its word nodes will get highly activated and this will basically and because both the languages nodes are also a kind of primed this will lead to the slowing uh, down of the participant recognizing this as a english word or a french word okay now in contrast say for example when a non homographic control word is presented there will generally be just one word node that will reach the highest level of uh, activation and also which will have membership in only one of the two languages okay uh, so this is sort of how uh, this particular model explains the interlingual homograph effect also the effects of relative frequency as i was saying are accounted for by the assumption of differences in the resting level activation of the words across the two languages that's also something that i already said and is uh, in some sense counter uh, in some sense uh, rather intuitive as well now alternatively Uh, about this uh, homograph effect dextra and colleagues assume that if interlexical homographs are not represented in two separate nodes but share the same word node between the two languages this node will be connected differently to the two languages the reason that such an arrangement can be slightly implausible because the simulations of this type of model uh, would produce result i mean they kind of tried this kind of thing they said that uh, this particular word uh, word node uh, will basically uh, be sharing the language connections and when they try to simulate with this kind of uh, pattern they found uh, deviant results so the assumption is that uh, there will be two uh, word nodes for uh, just to revise uh, for you uh, two word nodes for the interlingual homographs one in english 
one in Dutch. So, suppose say for example, the word is chef uh, and we are talking about English French, there will be one English version of uh, chef and a French version of, uh, of uh, French and basically uh, the interactions building up from feature level to letter level to word level and then to the language node level will basically make sure that only one of the two versions of the word chef are selected. That is how uh, they are kind of uh, you know accounting for this uh, interlingual homograph effect. Now, what would happen if the interlingual homographs were to be sounded differently? So, the BIA does not really contain uh, phonological representations and is therefore not really equipped to explain this. Uh, neither it kind of can explain this on the basis of memory, etc. So, a solution uh, to this basically comes up in a sort of a different uh, model, uh, which is called the SOFIA model, uh, again by Dijkstra and Van Uyen, slightly later in 2001. And they kind of address the issue in the SOFIA model by adding two additional layers. They say, let there be a level of orthographic clusters and orthographic syllables. Also, there is interestingly that this model kind of um, uh, specifies phonology in uh, you know uh, in four kind of analog levels, analogous levels of nodes that represent phonological units uh, of different sizes. Uh, the processing assumptions are very similar to the, in that in, uh, the, in the BIA model and uh, basically uh, the idea is that within each level there is lateral inhibition and uh, interactive activation going on. So, let us look at SOFIA. Uh, this is the SOFIA model you have letters and phonemes and then you have P clusters, phonological clusters, uh, phonological syllables, orthographical clusters, orthographical syllables, you know, phonological word forms, orthographical word forms, then you have the language node and also connection to semantics. So, this is what I was talking about. SOFIA differs from the BIA model in one very important aspect that is whereas BIA does contain both excitatory connections from each word node to the corresponding language and inhibitory connection from the language node to all the words of the other language, the latter connections have been removed in SOFIA. So, there you can see in the model there are no inhibitory connections coming from the language node to words of all the you know to the words of the other language. Another version of the BIA uh, other than uh, you know the uh, SOFIA, uh, the BIA plus has also kind of uh, improved upon the earlier proposition and what it has done is, is it has added to itself a sort of a task decision system. Now, this task decision system basically takes into account the uh, demands of language performance. Say for example, testing in these uh, kinds of studies happens in different kinds of uh, scenarios where the tasks are different, the task requirements are different and still you see that bilinguals are kind of adapting to these different tasks. And suppose it is a picture naming study, it is a picture word interference study, it is a lexical decision study, it is a word naming study. In all of these different tasks, the task requirements will be different and the bilinguals sort of adapt to these task requirements almost seamlessly. To explain how bilinguals might be doing this, uh, it might be uh, it, it was actually a good idea to have something called a task representation schema. Basically, what this task representation schema does, it is that it is very sensitive to extra linguistic influence, not from the language, but the influences about context, speaker. Uh, and other kinds of influences, where basically what happens is that the word identification system is not only uh, affected by the linguistic variables, but also by the context variables. Suppose you are doing a lexical decision task in which you are doing a pure English block, pure uh, Dutch block or a mixed block. So, as a participant you will be aware of that, I can expect uh, no in Dutch words in the English block. So, I have to adopt a very conservative strategy in uh, lexical decision here or I can expect both words from English and Dutch. So, I do not know whether this particular word is a English word or a Dutch word. So, I will probably uh, adopt a slightly uh, less conservative strategy. So, the system has been designed to deal with this kind of a thing and this is how this particular model looks. So, you have sort of the same uh, model, you have orthography, you have phonology as well by the way in the BIA plus, you have sublexical phonology, lexical phonology, sublexical orthography, lexical orthography, you have language nodes and you have semantics as well. On top of this identification system, you have the task schema and this task schema kind of specifies processing steps at for the task at hand. In the lexical decision task, you will have to do this. In the naming task, you have to do this. And this is that system that is receiving continuous input from the identification system. So, on the basis of that, it is deciding. Also, the decision criteria is basically uh, kind of uh, determined when a response is made on relevant codes. The codes are kind of 
the linguistic as well as non linguistic this is another set of uh, uh, you know a bit of a model that kind of helps us understand how bilinguals are dealing with tasks such as um, identifying words from the two languages now coming back to this whole notion of uh, inhibition and uh, you know coming back to muter and alport's study in 1989 uh, we talked about uh, suppression or inhibition being applied to a particular language now uh, green uh, from uh, you know that study uh, after that study kind of started thinking of uh, a language specific process or language specific processes and then general uh, cognitive skills that could determine how a bilingual speaker responds in a variety of language tasks avoiding interference from the non target irrelevant language at the same time so the inhibitory control system so the proposal is that there is a sort of an inhibitory control system and this inhibitory control system uh, includes a goal monitoring mechanism and a supervisory attentional system that kind of interacts with the language specific systems that are uh, wired to carry out a particular task again uh, be it uh, lexical decision word naming picture naming picture word interference or anything like that all of these systems the goal uh, system the inhibitory system uh, and this uh, you know the uh, supervisory attentional system uh, will interact with the lemma and lexeme level representations that will basically reflect your knowledge of the l1 and l2 components so inhibition or uh, activation shall has to be applied on some uh, you know basic knowledge of the two languages so there will be a uh, uh, system that has the lemma and lexeme level representations from both the languages now language switch costs according in this model can be incurred because of the changes in the goal status or the language task schema so the language task schema basically will be performing in a particular mode when naming is happening in english uh, or l1 and then it will have to shift its mode when it has to go for, uh, you know from english naming or l2 naming to hindi naming that is l1 naming and this shift you know this change in the goal uh, status or the language task schema might be held responsible for whatever switching costs people experience and different kinds of errors basically can occur if the supervisory attentional system is uh, not performing uh, in an optimal fashion causing sometimes an inadvertent change in the task schema so that can also happen if your attention wavers if you are not conscious of the uh, the contextual cues uh, the speaker listener thing or say for example there are other uh, reasons now the supervisory attentional system in this model is also involved in voluntary changes in the language task suppose say for example you uh, in the bilingual naming task now you see a cue uh, that asks you to name in english now you see a cue that you ask you to name in hindi so this voluntary changes are also kind of handled by this supervisory attentional system okay and it kind of uh, in uh, indexes in the brain activity as well now an advantage of this kind of a model is that it can help us explain how bilinguals can perform different tasks with different set of language requirements uh, almost uh, completely avoiding uh, these kind of unwanted intrusions so basically uh, once you are very attentive there is enough input in the supervisory attentional system and that is vigilant okay this is the cue i have to uh, shift to this language this is the cue i have to shift to this language and the supervisory attentional system kind of uh, you know can give that input to the language task schema which recognizes the goal state and adjust accordingly this is something that kind of uh, can help uh, the bilingual speaker achieve uh, almost uh, zero interference from the non target language to the target language irrespective of the kind of task that is uh, being done this inhibitory control model in that sense also can explain why l2 learners tend to master lexical semantics better than l2 syntax or grammar because in this system the lexical and semantic associations are fairly well specified this is uh, how this particular model looks like and you can see say for example there is g which is the goal state there is the supervisory attentional system there is the conceptualizer there is i which is the input the input directly starts with the bilingual lexico semantic system which kind of is typically what was happening in the bia and then there is this language task schemas and finally you have the output so the lexico semantic system is basically the one that contains the lemma and lexeme representation that the bilingual speaker needs to express or decipher meanings in the two language 
O is the output modality and you see that uh, this lexical and semantic system uh, communicates directly with the conceptualizer because the meaning uh, you know regardless of the two languages is uh, being accessed as a central uh, system and then you have the language task schema what is uh, the task at hand and this is also feeding uh, up to the SAS which is keeping the entire unit sort of vigilant and you see that the SAS is connected to the goal which is again kind of keeping in mind what is it uh, that I have to do. Okay. So, this is this is sort of the, uh, the inhibitory control model put forward by Green in 1998. Now, having said that uh, one of the last things that I wanted to talk about was this uh, concept of uh, you know uh, we talked about uh, the advantages that the bilinguals uh, you know can uh, you know uh, experience as knowing two languages. Now, uh, you see uh, that uh, you know given that the two languages of the bilinguals are simultaneously active in comprehension and production, given that in order to you know not uh, let the two languages interfere uh, a lot with each other, not lead to so many errors, bilinguals have particular mechanisms. The Green's inhibitory model, uh, inhibitory control model is just one model, there are other models as well, but they seem to have some sort of a mastery over a particular mechanism that will help them control the languages from interfering with each other. Now, generically speaking, this ability can be very useful not only in language performance, but also say for example, in scenarios where you, where you have to do two tasks at the same time. You know, you have to kind of tap with your left hand, uh, you know, tap with your hand as well as kind of count something. You have to, uh, you know, drive as well as, uh, you know, talk on the phone, which is obviously not advisable. Uh, but there are so many situations in uh, daily life where you are sometimes, uh, you know, you have to do two tasks at hand and you have to kind of control those two tasks in a way, in a way that they do not interfere with each other. Because bilinguals have been doing it for so long, you know, assuming that somebody is acquired first language from, acquired a second language from early childhood, assuming that they have got this practice with this inhibitory control uh, and this, uh, you know, elaborated practice which the monolinguals did not have access to, uh, this is what uh, has been proposed uh, to lead to, uh, you know, advantages for the bilinguals in many tasks that check for response inhibition, dual task performance, uh, you know, response shifting and as you know, similar other component abilities. Uh, there are a lot of tasks, uh, you know, like these uh, basically and response planning, etc., wherein bilinguals have been shown to be advantageous over monolinguals. Now, uh, some of the examples could be the ANT task that is the attentional networking task uh, by Posner and the task is basically that you have five arrows, one of the arrows is pointing towards a different side than the other four arrows and you have to kind of respond to the, you know, what the particular arrow is doing. Say for example, there is one arrow this side, four arrows this side, you have to press a button that kind of says that, okay, the arrow is pointing towards the left side, something like that. Basically, it kind of asks you to uh, inhibit the activation from the arrows that were pointing this side and activate a that the arrow is pointing, that the central arrow is pointing towards this side. This and there are other kinds of tasks like the Simon task, uh, you know, which is basically uh, sort of again a test of response compatibility uh, and uh, so on. So, there have been this and so many other tasks, the ambiguous figures task, there is a particular figure which can be uh, interpreted as one or the other kind of drawing. Okay. So, there are so many of these tasks uh, across which bilinguals have been shown to be uh, having some advantage over monolinguals and uh, what traditionally the research has done is that uh, traditionally the research has uh, attributed this advantage to the bilinguals extended practice uh, with inhibiting and uh, you know with inhibiting the other language and selecting the relevant language uh, uh, for the task at hand. Now, uh, this research has also now been by the way, uh, now is being called into question and there are some very interesting debates going on in bilingualism literature uh, at the moment, uh, partly saying that uh, you know that is not really the case that bilinguals do not really have this kind of advantage over monolinguals and the uh, reasons are uh, varied from conceptual to uh, you know things like you know pointing out methodological issues across the studies. But again, this is a very interesting area and uh, a lot of research is going on in this area uh, with respect to whether bilinguals actually enjoy some advantage over their monolingual counterparts. Now, this is uh, apparently all that I wanted to talk about bilingualism. Uh, I will end the unit of, uh, uh, of bilingualism with this uh, 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 lecture and this is what I wanted to talk about bilingualism. However, 
this is uh, also being the last lecture of the day. Uh, I will try and conclude uh, whatever we have done in this lecture. Uh, we started with talking about some of the fundamental issues of language. We talked about uh, evolution of language. We uh, talked a little bit about acquisition of language. What, how are the different components of language acquired, starting from an infant who is uh, you know 48 hours old to an adult. Uh, we talked then about words, we talked about uh, you know sentences, we talked about uh, uh, producing words, we talked about uh, you, know, uh, uh, you know reading, uh, we talked about uh, disorders of reading like dyslexia, we talked about cognitive neuroscience, we talked a little bit about aphasia and then in, uh, you know we talked a little bit about um, you know the neural basis of language and then finally we talked about bilingualism. The idea that I wanted to put forth in this course is uh, to uh, you know get to uh, get you to an appreciation of whatever the entire uh, you know uh, gamut of language uh, is, whatever whatever is the entire gamut of abilities uh, that language kind of uh, you know uh, brings uh, with it, and how we can study these different uh, you know uh, sorts of uh, you know uh, components of language. Uh, I hope this would have been uh, an enjoyable course, and people would have followed uh, what has been done. We have not really been able to share a lot of material uh, due to copyright issues and uh, stuff. So, I hope that uh, you are listening to the lectures more uh, than just uh, you know uh, looking at the slides and uh, so on. Uh, the more you listen to the lecture and suppose say for example, if you can uh, dig out and find the original uh, you know text that has been referenced. Uh, it will help you uh, gain a very good understanding of what language is and might be helpful in uh, various ways. So, uh, that will be all from me uh, from this course. I hope that uh, you know whoever of you is uh, giving the exam uh, goes through mostly the lectures then the slides and prepares for it accordingly.